and welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm your host, Rebecca Rose. In today's episode, we will hear about how NASA studies and prepares for the risks of human spaceflight from right here on Earth. Aerospace engineer Ashley Kowalski has been selected to participate in an eight-month analog space mission that will study the biological and psychological effects of isolation and confinement experienced during long-duration human spaceflight. Aerospace's Paul Frakes catches up with Ashley to learn more about the closed habitat mission. She's coming to us from Moscow, Russia, and is just about to lift off. Over to you, Paul. All right. Well, thanks very much, Rebecca. I'm really glad to be here today with Ashley Kowalski, uh, seven time zones apart, all the way from Moscow, Russia. Thanks for being here, Ashley. Thank you for having me. You bet. So this is a really exciting time in your life, I know, and I'm really excited for our audience to hear all about the, the mission that you're about to embark on. So tell us a little bit about the, the serious mission that NASA's got you participating in. Yeah, so SIRIUS stands for um, Scientific International Research in a Unique Terrestrial Station. So um, basically, uh, it's a ground-based space simulation, or you know, more commonly known as an astronaut analog study. And um, basically, we are um, simulating how a long duration uh, human space flight would be, and uh, you know, looking at different. Um, factors uh, such as, you know, psychological factors, sociological factors, immunological factors, biological factors, things like that. Great. So even though you're, you're in Earth's gravity, there's still a lot to learn in terms of uh, teaming and, and what it really takes to be an astronaut. So can you tell us a, about maybe some of the experiments? I know you mentioned that there's uh, not only an international component to this insofar as you're in Russia and working with folks from other nations, but there's actually experiments that have been uh, assigned to you guys for um, all kinds of those those factors. Can you tell us a little bit about those experiments? Yeah, sure. So in addition to the eight experiments that NASA has submitted for the study, there are in total about 70 different experiments um, that we will be running. Uh, they've been submitted from all around the world, from Japan to the Emirates to the Czech Republic, um, to uh, Germany. Uh, so they all range to, from uh, you know, uh, gauging social interactions, gauging multicultural interactions. Um, some are more physical um, in the sense that, you know, we have to do some, um, you know, maximum running tests and biking tests and things like that. And, uh, you know, some are based more on um, looking at our individual micro microflora and seeing how our in inner biology changes in an isolated and confined environment. Um, so, you know, there will be some studies where, um, well, I hope this isn't too gross for our audience, but, you know, we uh, do give urine and, and uh, fecal samples and um, they do create, uh, the researchers here at the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow, they create uh, probiotics, individualized probiotics for us to take. And so that's one example of how, you know, they'll, um, try to see how that improves our inner microflora and, and hopefully use that in the future for astronauts in their long duration space flights. Wow. That's, uh, that's really interesting. I'm glad <laughs> that you're, you're comfortable with that and, and you know, that um, you're able to, to prepare well for that. So I want to ask a little bit about the, the preparation because it sounds like it's, you know, maybe a little bit intensive or, or, or personal. Um, so what, what kind of things, you know, you and I are both, engineers in our in our background, but obviously you mentioned a lot of things that go beyond just sort of the the typical engineering sciences that, you know, we're just doing, uh, you know, math and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the challenges that that you've encountered on, on a personal level or, or you know, social level um, in getting ready to, to go into isolation for for this duration? Yeah, so um, I'll touch on a couple different aspects there. So, you know, physically, um, I knew that this program was going to involve, you know, a lot of uh, running and, and biking and, you know, strength, um, strength training uh, in order to understand how the body physically changes to an isolated and confined environment. Um, so I, you know, prepared myself uh, in that in, in a physical sense, first and foremost. Um, but emotionally and psychologically and mentally, which I think is actually going to be um, the most difficult part of this mission, um, 
you know, uh, you, uh, you, you, it's really a lot of inner soul searching. I think um, you uh, try to understand, you know, how do you react to certain situations and um, try to understand, okay, well, if somebody does says this to me, or if I make a mistake on some project and, um, or, you know, if, I feel like I didn't perform my best today. How do I myself feel in that situation? And do I feel flustered? Do I feel angry? Do I feel sad? Do I feel happy? And trying to understand that first in order to be able to uh, assess and 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 work towards understanding how you can, uh, you know, react better to that situation. Um, so for, for lack of better explanation, it's really more just, a lot of inner soul searching and inner uh, understanding of how you react in different situations. So can you tell us a little bit about where you are right now and if you've had a chance to actually talk with some of your, your crewmates and maybe get a head start on, on doing some of that soul searching together as a team? Yeah, so um, as you know, the, the actual mission is eight months, but I've already been here um, since the end of August because for the last two months, um, we have been working together with both the prime and the backup crew, getting to know each other more, um, spending time together. Um, also, you know, of course, learning about all the experiments and how to run them uh, successfully. And, you know, so we've pretty much spent all day every day with each other for the last two months. Um, and that's been really, it's, it's, of course, been extremely helpful because we're starting to understand each other's personalities better. Um, we're trying to, under, uh, we're beginning to understand, you know, the different uh, cultural differences that exist between us and uh, learning about different cultures and, and the whole, um, you know, using basically two different language constantly throughout the day between Russian and English. Um, you know, that in and, it's, in and of itself is a challenge, but, you know, everybody here, everybody that's here wants to be here. And we are learning of how to uh, work through these different these differences among each other. And you know, as long we're all keeping a very positive mindset about this. Like I said, we all want to be here. We all signed up for this. Um, so um, you know, we're we're mentally ready, and uh, we've uh, you know culturally and 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 personality wise adapted to each other. So um, you know, fingers crossed. No <laughs> no issues moving forward. No, that's great. And it sounds like you guys are, are on a good footing to, to go into this experiment together. And it'll be very interesting to see at the end of that eight months, how, if at all, the, those relationship dynamics have changed. Um, you mentioned a couple of different languages that you're using right now. You're using English mm -hmm. and Russian. Um, are those the, the primary languages or the, the first languages of every person on the crew? Um, or how many other languages are, are, are represented among the, your, your teammates? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, so um, there is, the, I'll, well, I'll touch really quickly on the crew makeup just so that um, everyone understands, uh, you know, what we are, um, what the team consists of. And so basically uh, on the team, uh, the prime team that will actually go into the eight month isolation, there are three Russians, uh, two Americans and one Emirati. And the crew itself is also a 50-50 male, female makeup. And so um, all of the Russians that and and the uh, all the Russians and the Emiratis that had to uh, that were accepted into the program, they all had to pass English proficiency exams. And all of the Americans that had to, that were selected for the program also had to pass Russian proficiency exams. And so that included, you know, oral um, writing, reading, um, and listening exercises. And so. Um, yeah, it's expected that all of us can speak at both English and Russian uh, levels, at, at least the intermediate level. Um, and yeah, it's kind of fun. We call it Runglish <laughs> between the Russian and the English. So it's kind of crazy because, you know, now my mind is almost thinking partially in Russian sometimes, and I can't even think of the word in English anymore. So half of my sentence will be in English and then the end of it will be in Russian. And, you know, it's, it's really fun and it's really cool to be among a group of people that can understand both languages. And so, you know, they can really, uh, you know, they really get it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's a lot of fun. And I, I've done the same thing. I know you and I speak a little, you probably speak more German than I do. We spoke a little bit um, while we were colleagues at, here in, in the States. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's always a lot of fun. Hopefully you'll you'll start to dream in Russian. I think that's that's the, the key, right? When you start to dream in another language, that's how you know you're, you've made it. 
Yeah, um, I mean, a hundred percent. When you start to dream in another language, when you start to joke in another language, that's yeah, exactly like you said. That's a hundred percent how you know you've made it. <laughs> so yeah, and you know, languages have also always kind of been a part of my life. So it really, it really makes me happy to be among this like multicultural um, uh, team. So. <laughs> And I know also at aerospace, you've been able to leverage some of that, that passion for, you know, multicultural elements of, of life and, and, um, and that sort of thing with the global partnerships uh, group that you've been a part of. So can you talk a little bit about maybe the work that you did at aerospace just at a high level that kind of prepared you um, or at least, you know, helped sustain that, that passion in you before you went over here to, uh, to Moscow? Yeah, for sure. Um... So as you mentioned, I do work with the Global Partnerships Department at Aerospace. And, um, you know, on a daily basis, uh, we are constantly interacting with uh, different nations from Germany to Australia to, to England to France to Luxembourg uh, to, to South American countries. To, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, so we are... You know, I've I've gained a lot of experience um, understanding how to you know diplomatically speak to these nations because of course you know as an aerospace employee we're we're not only representing aerospace but we're also representing um, you know the the space force and air force um, when we do these kinds of discussions um, with our allied nations and so um, you know working with global partnerships of course has uh, taught me a lot about you know. Um, international interactions and, and cultural understanding um, and, uh, you know, how to um, approach different topics and how to discuss, you know, things both professionally and personally with uh, different uh, entities. And so, um, you know, that's been, that's been extremely helpful. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, I want to ask a little bit. So we, we've established this whole global partnerships element of the mission and, and all the different languages. So you're, you're ready to be an ambassador from Earth. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the details of this eight month mission, this analog that you're about to, to embark on? Um, I understand that there's sort of a lunar component to this. Can you talk a little bit about what mm -hmm. you'll be doing um, on a day to day basis to, to simulate those elements of space flight? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, just like you mentioned, uh, we will be simulating a lunar mission. Um, so just imagine that, you know, we are going to the moon and we are, you know, st staying on the lunar gateway and doing lunar excursions down to the lunar surface. Um, and yeah, so throughout the experiment, there will be of course, as I already mentioned, the like, you know, physical and psychological and physiological experiments that we run within the actual capsule on a day-to-day -day basis. So every morning, um, you know, we meet with mission control back on earth and they kind of, uh, they go through the program for the day for each one of us so that we understand, okay, well, I have, you know, uh, a max running test today, um, or, you know, the commander has, um, you know, 3D printing duty today, or, you know, the mission specialist one has, um, you know, uh, preparation for sleep study today, you know, th something like that. So we each get our own, um, you know, schedule for the day, every, each day from mission control. Um, and then in addition to that, there will be some actual lunar extravehicular um, excursions. And so um, we do get to uh, suit up <laughs> in our uh, in our actual space suits and use virtual reality to do um, uh, an actual spacewalk where we'll have certain tasks to do, like, you know, picking up samples or, you know, uh, riding an act or, you know, driving the actual lunar rover. Um, things like that. So <laughs> yeah, we, so we do have a lot of uh, virtual reality types of experiments that we um, get to use here, which is really fantastic because they're going to use those hopefully in the future to help train, uh, you know, astronauts for, you know, long duration human space flight. Um, nobody knows exactly what it's going to be like to walk on Mars, but the best we can do is simulate it in a virtual reality environment. So, um, you know, we're testing out a lot of the new software that they're building here. Um, and the idea is that, It'll be used in the future. Um, That's great. I'm so yeah. glad that you and and some of the you know they're they're getting some of the smartest people that we've got to figure out and sort of beta test some of those those simulation tools and and figure out how best to train you know new generations of of uh, of space explorers. You know I think it, it's going to be really interesting to see 
how the how human space flight uh, changes from generation to generation. You know, so you know, one of the thoughts that I had as as you were talking was, you know, we had these in generations past, we've had you know very elite astronauts that are you know very highly uh, intelligent, highly trained, um, you know, very specific tools, that sort of thing. But we're at a point now in human spaceflight where we're making that more accessible to other people, um, and you're able to be a part of that. So I'm just curious, you know, what are your thoughts actually about uh, where the next generation or generations of human spaceflight are going as we talk about sending not just dozens of people into space, but thousands or, or more? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I 100% believe that the type of astronaut uh, is 100% going to look different in the next even three, four years, as opposed to what it did back in the, the 60s. Um, sure, you know, having a, a test pilot license is, is wonderful and helpful, but, you know, uh, what we really need for long duration uh, spaceflight and, and long duration missions is, you know, more of like, you know, what the normal science, like, I don't want to say normal sciences, but, you know, we need geologists, we need biologists, we need, um, we need, uh, you know, psychologists, we need people that understand, um, you know, how to maintain a, a, a copacetic society if we're going to be out there for, you know, eight months, a year, longer than a year, who knows what the future holds. Um, you need, you need lawyers, you need, uh, you need, you need people that are understand how to, um, you know, run a, a political society, things like that. So, I mean, in my opinion, at least, like, you know, you're really going to need a very wide variety of, of type of person, um, you know, something that more readily represents what we actually have here on Earth. Um, sure, of course, you know, the science, the techn technical background is, of course, necessary. I mean, you can't just send up somebody that has, you know, maybe no experience. But I think that a lot of those things will be able to be taught during astronaut training and in the future. Um, so, you know, when, when people are training on, on, you know, piloting a module or training on how to, um, you know, pick up and analyze Martian rock samples or lunar samples, um, or, you know, how to actually, you know, successfully uh, grow live plants and vegetables in, in space, you know, botanists, like, you know, things like that. Um, so I really think that the type of astronaut is, um, just rapidly changing as, as we speak. I mean, um, like I said, st still, still STEM background is, is helpful and necessary, but, um, you know, I think a lot of what will be useful and, and necessary in the future can be, um, learned as part of the astronaut training as well. And, uh, yeah, so different type of, no, that's, that's astronaut. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, no, that, those are great comments. I appreciate hearing all of that. Um, and one, one kind of last comment about just a serious mission. Can you kind of put that into a larger context, right? So this is an eight month mission. Um, can you tell folks just about the other missions that are going on in that series to kind of help us learn all the things that you just talked about and, and, and help feed that conversation about what long duration spaceflight is really gonna be like? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, the thing that I really wanna point out is that Sirius stands out um, specifically in terms of comparing it to other astronaut analog studies, because it's the first time really that um, an astronaut analog study has been done very systematically. Uh, so Sirius began with um, Sirius 17. Uh, it was a 17 day mission. Um, next they had Sirius 19, which was a four month mission. Now we're having Sirius 21, which is an eight month mission, of course. And then after this mission, there will be uh, another Sirius, uh, it'll be a full year mission. And each time they run these missions, uh, they are you know, running a lot of the exact same experiments so that you really have a wide variety of data to see how all of the changes actually compare from a shorter duration isolated and confined environment to an extremely long duration isolated and, and confined environment. And again, um, you know, it's a, a lot of the previous long duration astronaut analog studies have been all male. So this is the first time that they're really, they, of course, you know, we're, we're putting emphasis equally on all crew members, but you know, a particular emphasis on, on, on female crew members to see, you know, because our bodies are obviously different, um, different microflora, different, 
you know, biological changes and, and, and issues and things like that. And so, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really the fact that this is a very systematic approach to an astronaut analog study. Um, and um, that really hasn't been done previously. So Ashley, you mentioned some virtual reality uh, tools and training that you're going to be using uh, not only to prepare for the mission, but also while you're while you're on this uh, eight month mission. Could you tell us a little bit more uh, details about that on, on the technical side? How are you going to be using that and what is that going to look like? Yeah, so um, one example of virtual reality is a psychological support um, that we're using. And so that pretty much gives us a chance to put the virtual reality headset on we have our own settings and it brings us into this virtual um, living room basically where it's kind of like our own quiet space where we can you know change the weather outside uh, change the sounds we can look at pictures of our family um, and so that's an example of a psychological support that um, we're testing out and seeing how our mood changes how uh, more relaxed we feel afterwards um, did it help with our stress levels things like that and you know depending on pending the results um, of this study and and most likely the the following uh, serious mission after this um, that might be something that is included in future uh, long duration human spaceflight another example of virtual reality um, which is one of my favorite experiments that we've done or research studies that we've done um, and been training on in the last two months is a uh, docking simulation actually it's a very realistic docking simulation and the aim is basically to investigate how a pilot's um, or uh, how, how the abilities of a pilot either deteriorate or remain the same, we'll see, over time as you're living in an isolated and confined environment. So, you know, we had 10 hours of uh, training on the specific device, different types of scenarios like docking to the International Space Station, docking to the Lunar go Gateway, um, you know, docking uh, to um, a more of a, a constantly rotating object, things like that. They threw different scenarios at us. And uh, we took baseline uh, data collection at this point before the mission. And then we'll be doing those doc docking simulations throughout the eight months as well. And they will, you know, take data on, you know, where are our eyes looking in the virtual reality environment? And, you know, are we looking more at the instrument panel versus doing a visual docking or vice versa? And, you know, how did our piloting skills improve or, de or deteriorate during the duration of the eight months in isolation and confined environment? Um, so, yeah, um, that's, that's pre pretty much the gist of it. Um, but again, that's, one of my favorite studies, and it comes to us actually from uh, one of the German universities uh, that submitted. So, that's really fascinating. I'm glad we're getting a chance to see what AR VR will will look like and and how it's actually being used practically in experiments. You you mm -hmm. mentioned baselining um, your performance like within those those AR VR environments. Can you tell us what other baselining um, metrics are being captured? I know you. I think you mentioned. The, the physical aspect and, you know, you're probably doing a lot of running and that kind of thing. Can you tell us about some of the physical baseline that they're tracking right now? Yeah. So um, we have done uh, both running and uh, biking, cycling uh, baselines. And when we do those tests, we pretty much are um, strapped in with, you know, a bunch of electrodes all over our body to track our heart rate. We've got a, a breath mask on, um, to capture the breath by breath gas analysis of what we're breathing out. Um, it checks also, you know, the volume of our, of our lungs, the, the flow rate of the air coming out, things like that. Um, there's another running test where, you know, we had an F nears device on our forehead as we were doing a cognitive test during the run. So for example, you know, um, we were, we would, you know, run, you know, do a warm up, then you run at it like a higher speed and, you know, and constantly increase the speeds or, uh, decrease the speeds, sorry. And, uh, basically, uh, there is a test where, you know, there's, um, you know, you, you basically click the direction of the arrow, um, as you're running with different clickers. And the idea here is that, um, you know, uh, as this could relate for future human spaceflight, at least is the idea that you know, for, for true EVAs in, in, in the future, especially, you know, for long duration space flight, um, you know, there's a lot of constraints, you know, when you're dealing with these heavy, uh, 
spacesuits. So the idea is that, you know, when you're under a physical stress or when you're under some type of, you know, more intense physical activity than your body might be used to or, you know, than your everyday life, how does your cognitive function start changing in that aspect? So when, you know, future astronauts are doing these longer duration EVAs and, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're all suited up, is their cognitive function changing? And did, you know, were, was their cognitive function also better at the beginning of their mission at the one month point versus at the eight month point? And how did that change over time? And so um, we're helping researchers and scientists to understand, you know, that relation between, you know, physical fitness and cognitive ability, and also how our bodies are changing over time in this specific unique environment. Ashley, can you tell us more about the, the, the daily routines? You mentioned some of the things you're doing with, with the, your fellow crewmates, but even just basic things like food and hygiene. Can you tell us what that's going to look like for you over the next eight months? Yes, sure thing. So food-wise, um, all of the food that we eat is essentially sublimated food um, or, you know, air-dried food. So basically, um, you know, we would get a packet and... It would kind of look like, you know, it, if you want to think of like instant oatmeal, basically, it looks like that when you put it in the bowl. But for example, it might be Russian borscht or, um, you know, mashed potatoes with chicken in it. So what happens is that, you know, you just add in a little bit of water, mix it around, and then voila, you have your ready meal. <laughs> and I will say that they actually look pretty visually appealing. And we had one night already that we spent over in the facility to kind of test it out. And we got to try some of the food and I will say it's pretty tasty. So um, I'm uh, that, you know, alleviated any worries I might have about that. Um, yeah, so sublimated food for the enti entire duration of the mission. Um, and then hygiene wise, yeah. So that's, that's an interesting <laughs> one because we actually are only allowed to take a shower once a week. Um, so, you know, of course, I think that'll be a little bit difficult for all of us, especially since, you know, we're doing so much physical activity during the week. Um, and, you know, the days that, of course, we don't have a shower, what we're provided with are, you know, body wipes um, and, you know, wet towels to kind of wipe down and and uh, stuff like that. <laughs> well, very cool. Thanks for for sharing everything that uh, that you shared with us today. Um, I'm really excited to see what the results of, of not just your duration uh, experiment is going to be, but also the entire series of, of serious experiments. Um, so just a few, you know, last minute questions just for fun. This whole time I've been thinking about some of the sci-fi movies that sort of are reminiscent of what you're about to undertake. You know, the, the movie Passengers comes to mind, you know, I think Chris Pratt and uh, Jennifer Lawrence get trapped on a spaceship and very talk about, you know, isolation. Um, so I'm just curious, what are some of the the sci-fi or, or even, you know, other genres of fiction that have inspired you either, you know, while you've been in quarantine there in Moscow or just throughout your life, what are some of the, the inspirational sources that you've drawn from um, that have made you want to, you know, undertake this whole spaceflight endeavor? Well, um, <laughs> I'll start with the fact that, you know, I, I do have at least, you know, one favorite sci-fi movie and that is of course interstellar but i hate to dis i hate to disappoint in the sense that you know i really wasn't ever very very into science fiction movies or books um so you know i i don't really take a lot of my inspiration from that necessarily um you know i uh of course i i enjoy those movies whenever i watch them you know and and whatnot but you know it's it's not really something that I grew up with. Um, and so I can't really, I guess, expand too much on that besides the fact that, you know, I love Interstellar, but, you know, I, I really didn't um, get too much of my inspiration from science fiction. Fair enough. I think that's actually kind of an interesting thing to note. And hopefully it's encouraging to a lot of our audience that, hey, you don't actually have to be a sci-fi geek like some of us at Aerospace to uh, to, to take an interest in, in human space flight and really get out there literally. So maybe the, the follow up question to that would be what what would be your inspiration? What, you know, drove you to want to be an astronaut or an astronaut analog in the first place? Yeah, you know, um, it's a really good question. Because, you know, as, as it, you know, we already noted, I wasn't really a sci fi geek. I, you know, I had always liked math and science growing up. I, but I never 
I guess I wasn't exposed at a young age to, you know, the, the whole idea of, of space and, and, you know, human space flight too much. I mean, yes, of course, I, I, I thought astronauts were the coolest things ever, but, you know, it wasn't something that I really buckled down into until I got to university. And I remember the exact moment, you know, when, you know, I was sitting with, you know, some of my study mates in university and we were just having a deep discussion saying, you know, what's your, what's your actual dream in life? And, you know, I sat there and I thought, and I was like, and this was the first time I actually ever said it out loud, I think was sophomore year of university where I said, I, I want to be an astronaut. And immediately, you know, I looked at my friends and I was like, oh gosh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but no, my friends were just like, no, that's amazing. You're on the right path. Like you're doing, you know, you're, you're studying engineering, you're involved in these, you know, space internships that you do, like, you know, you're, you're on the right path. And so ever since then, you know, everything I've done in the back of my mind, sure, you know, I'm always trying to better myself. And I, and I, I do, I, I like to work towards certain goals. And, you know, I, um, you know, just in general, like to hope that I'm part of some kind of uh, improvement in in science and technology and and the future of human spaceflight, even by doing this program specifically. But um, you know, I I think that this is um, you know really important to me uh, personally, because um, you know this really feeds into some of the the goals and dreams that you know I'm finally saying out loud and that you know I'm really understanding is within my reach. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that. I know it's, it's a little bit personal, but I think that's what makes human spaceflight so inspirational to so many people is that we're actually able to have some of those those personal conversations. So that's that's really helpful. All right, Ashley. Well, I think I'm going to let you go, but I, I can't do that without commenting on your room. I know when we went to the wide shot there, you look like you're in prison. So can you tell us a little bit briefly about, you know, your your living conditions there in, in, in quarantine? Is it is it as bad as, you know, COVID-19 quarantine? <laughs> yeah, so um, so you're right. I am in quarantine right now. So for about three weeks prior to isolation, um, especially with you know the fact that uh, we are still dealing with a COVID world, uh, they did want to protect all the participant participants from uh, you know potentially contracting any uh, any sicknesses. And so um, yes, we are confined to the second floor of building nine <laughs> here at IBMP, the Institute of Biomedical Problems. It's, um, yeah, it's it's great. You know, I, I've been having a good time, ironically, <laughs> I guess. Um, you know, we all thought that quarantine was going to, you know, really be rough and take a toll on us. Um, but really it's almost been a blessing in disguise. Every single night, you know, we kind of get together around the dinner table, all 12 of us primes and backups. Um, and we eat dinner together, we laugh with each other, we get to know each other better. Um, you know, we're still continuing our training during this time, of course. Um, and yeah, um, it's it's not as bad as it seems. I know this room looks very barren, but um, you know, there's not too many options here on the second floor. Um, <laughs> but you know, we have a separate girls got a girls room, a separate guys room. Um, like I said, we've got a kitchen area. We've got our you know private showers. It's uh, it's not so bad. It feels like summer camp in a way. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, it's 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 a good time and. Um, you know, like I said, the best part of it is really getting to spend more time with, uh, my crewmates and really getting to know them and, you know, just, just being here and being with them really almost alleviates any type of, you know, stress or anxiety or nerves that I might have, uh, going into this mission beforehand. And so, um, it's been a good time. All right. Well, are there any other final thoughts that you'd like to share with folks before you go into your eight months of isolation? Yeah, you know, um, so being here in Moscow and being a crew member for Series 21, it really is honestly a dream come true for me. Um, but it wasn't without its obstacles and um, a lot of hard work and patience. Um, you know, just so, uh, you know, just to explain my path to get here, you know, back in 20, November 2018, that's when I initially applied for the Sirius 19, the four-month mission, and I was rejected. And, you know, 
so a year later in November 2019 is when I applied for this eight month mission, you know, entering a lot of COVID delays and, um, you know, uh, application delays, things like that, um, just because there was so much unknown at the time. You know, it's now almost November 2021 or, or, or it is November 21. And, um, you know, so from the time that I first set my eyes on this serious program in November 2018 to now, that was a three year process. It was a three-year patient process of, you know, waiting and making sure I prepare myself and, um, you know, just uh, understanding that, you know, there's a lot unknown. And so I, I guess what I wanted to leave people with is that, you know, you the goals are not unreach unreachable. Um, they just sometimes take a little bit of time uh, and, and, and thought process and, and patience to get there. Um, so if I can do it, if I can be here, if I can make this dream come true, then um, then I know that you can too. <laughs> well, excellent. I'm glad that it's been an inspirational story for you, and, and I'm sure we're only part of the way through that story. So looking forward to see you when you come out on the other side. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a pleasure having this conversation, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. And we'll send it right back over to Rebecca. Thanks a lot. Thank you to Ashley and Paul for helping us understand what it takes to protect the future of human spaceflight. Ashley, our whole production team wishes you the best of luck as you embark on this eight month journey. We think you are extremely brave to accept this challenge. Check us out on Twitter using hashtag the space policy show. Sign up for our news and alerts at aerospace.org policy. And be sure to look for our podcast and share your favorite episodes with colleagues. We look forward to having you tune into the next episode of the Space Policy Show, and until then, take care.